Well, welcome to the Child Welfare Information Technology Systems Managers and Staff Webinar Series, brought to you on behalf of the Health and Human Services Administration for Children and Families Children's Bureau. My name is Philip Breitenbusher, and I am your host for today's webinar. Today's discussion entitled Practical Guidance, Comprehensive Child Welfare Information Systems, CWIS, Contracting and Procurement, Strategies to Manage Risk, Reduce Change Orders and Disputes, and Attain Best Values. Today's presenters include Nicole Harder Schaefer, who's a federal analyst with the Division of State Systems, and Kim Bennett, Contract Manager, Procurement Documents Review Bureau, and Federal Con Contract Support, and myself, Phil Breitenbusher, as today's moderator. We want to encourage active participation throughout today's webinar, and you can participate in several ways. The first is we would like you to ask questions and encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation. Please type those questions using the question and answer feature, either at the bottom or the top of your screen, and you might see an icon similar to the one located at the top right of my screen. You can also ask questions over the phone or using your computer microphone by using the raise hand feature. Once you've raised, uh, once you've clicked on that feature and raised your hand, uh, I will send you a private chat just confirming you are ready to ask a question over uh, live over the phone or over your computer microphone. Once you've confirmed you are ready, our host will unmute your line and you'll be able to ask your question live. Uh, if you're joining us via the phone, you can just dial star nine and we'll see your hand raised. You can also uh, put your hand back down by hitting star nine again. Um, and if you would like to lower your hand, also use the raise hand feature to lower your hand if you do, if, if you do not have a question you'd like to ask. Okay, um, if you have questions that come up after today's webinar, please continue to email those questions to cwis.questions at acf.hhs.gov. Today's webinar uh, will start with some welcoming and introductory remarks from Nicole Harder Schaefer. Then Kim Bennett will discuss the roles, responsibilities, and opportunities for IT managers, program managers, and contract procurement managers to work together to create a procurement foundation that will support efficient project operations and best outcomes. Next, Kim will share 12 strategies to overcome challenges to CWIS procurements that have the potential to impede attainment of best value. We believe these lessons learned and solutions are applicable to all types of CWIS procurements. At the conclusion of today's webinar, there'll be time for questions and discussion. And once again, we encourage your active participation throughout today's webinar. So let's get started with some uh, engagement uh, by launching our first poll question. Today, we'd like to ask you how familiar are you with the contracting and procurement process? Please se select one of the following. Not at all familiar. What's a contract? Slightly familiar. I know where my contracts are located. I'm somewhat familiar. I understand the basics of contracts. Moderate, moderately familiar. I have helped develop and or executed contracts in the past. Or you're extremely familiar. From A to Z, I am actively involved and responsible for contracts. We'll now go ahead and launch the poll and give you a few seconds to respond. Okay, just a few more seconds and we're gonna close it out. All right, and let's see what your results look like. All right, well, 40, 44% 40, of you uh, say that you're moder moderately familiar and have helped develop or executed contracts, great. About a third of you are somewhat familiar and understand the basics. Um, 
The other smaller percents are either not very familiar or slightly familiar, and a few of you are extremely familiar. Wonderful. All right, let's stay here with you. Well, uh, and move to uh, our second polling question, which is, what is the primary role that you play in relation to CWIS contracting and procurement at your agency? Again, please select one of these. We understand some of you fulfill multiple functions, but please select the one that best describes you. We'll go ahead and launch the poll. Are you with information and technology? Are you a child welfare program person? Are you in contracting and procurement? Are you on the fiscal side of things? Or maybe none of these or some other. Again, we'll give you a few seconds to respond to this. Okay, uh, just a couple more seconds. And then uh, we're gonna go ahead and close out this poll. We thank you for your participation. Excellent. Let's go ahead and see what those results look like. Okay, um, again, the majority of you, 44%, or a good portion of you at least, are with information technology. And then we're pretty evenly spread out with uh, program folks, contracting and procurement. Thank you for joining us today. We appreciate you being here, as well as fiscal and budget. And then um, almost 20% of you uh, are in, in another function. But so again, we appreciate you being here as well. Okay, folks, stay with us. We have one more polling question just to help our presenters get to know you a little bit better. Um, so our third polling question, uh, before we get started with today's uh, presentation and opening remarks is this, which of the following activities have you either participated in or had responsibility for at your agency? And this one, pick all that apply. You've had responsibility for overall procurement process, developing a statement of work, or sometimes called an SOW, developing a budget, developing and launching the request for proposals or RFPs, uh, contract negotiation or finalization with the vendor, contract execution, ongoing contract oversight or implementation. We'll go ahead and launch that poll. Again, please select all that apply to you so that our presenters can get to know you uh, a little bit better as we get started today. Okay, this one's a little bit longer, so we're gonna give you just about another 30 seconds. If you could just select all that apply, um, that would be great. Actually, I'm um, sorry. Uh, Tom, let's go ahead and move to the next polling question if we're able to start that again. All right, everyone, thank you. We saw that 60% responded to the same question twice, um, but let's, okay, let's make sure we have that third poll open. All right, okay, go ahead and show us the results. We'll see what happens. All right. Um, all right, I apologize. It looks like our responses did not match our question, but that's okay. Uh, we do appreciate your participation. Um, and um, so, uh, I noticed that our next, our first speaker um, is having a little bit of technical difficulty, which, you know, sometimes happens on live webinars. Um, so give us just one moment to check in and see if we can get her back on. Thank you. All right, well, uh, Nicole should be back with us in just a moment. Nicole, are you there? Hey, okay. so this is Nick. It sounds like the, uh, the technical issues are, are persisting. Would you please uh, fill in here? And, yeah. and then, uh, thank you. 
Sure. Okay. Well, um, let me go ahead and welcome again, everyone. Um, on behalf of Nicole and the federal team here, um, we are really excited to present to you this first webinar in a two-part series that's going to focus on the contracting and procurement process. And, and being from program myself and many of you, 44% of you were with uh, information technology, you know, um, we realized that really the three of us, uh, program, information technology, uh, procurement and contracting specialists, and I saw there's a good portion of you that are also budget and fiscal folks, we can sometimes speak different languages and also wonder who's really driving the bus, who's in charge, what roles and responsibilities do each of us play to ensure the best results? And we think this two-part series will help um, answer some of those questions. Um, and so we'll start today with um, kind of this this, uh, this concept of a CWIS vision for you. And, and we really like, would like for you to develop this user-centric solutions um, and, and implement kind of a continuous process improvement process. Um, and we understand that information technology is changing and improving rapidly. And so this is a constant kind of uh, moving target. And, and even more importantly, for each of this kind of three-legged stool of, of, of professionals and disciplines to be able to work together in this process from beginning to end uh, to really understand how we can have the best outcomes. And so we'll start today's webinar with this kind of this idea of a life cycle of, of the contracting process and the roles and responsibilities. Um, and then we will uh, look at some existing uh, or some challenges that are often um, faced uh, with these teams. Um, and the challenges that are sometimes faced with information technology are actually very similar to those um, in acquisition. And so we'll talk about some of the 12 common challenges and also solutions to overcoming those in today's webinar. Um, and then finish up with some uh, procurement procedures and templates that may need adjustment to fit development approaches, but may help accommodate this rapid change cycle that we're all living in. And maybe even more sped up now, uh, post the pandemic or midst of this pandemic that we're all living in. Um, and again, we think that the procurement process itself brings together this great opportunity for our different disciplines to come together, understand each other, communicate with each other and work together ultimately to provide the best outcomes. And we're really excited to bring you today, Kim Bennett, who has just a wealth of experience. Um, uh, she's really devoted her career to contracts management and um, you know, seen so many things. Her experience includes receiving training by some uh, terrific contract officers over the US EPA. Uh, she provides um, perspective on contract with eyes of both contractor and, and the government, uh, which I think is helpful. Um, and she just has such a range of experience over the years, really since, I, I hate to say this because she's so young, but she's been doing this since the 90s. So please, if you will, welcome for us, uh, Kim. We're so pleased to learn uh, from your in-depth experience with CWIS contract reviews. And uh, we are glad you're with us. Kim, go ahead and take it away. Section 1.0, a contractual foundation for best outcomes. Thanks, Bill. Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, the good work you're doing for CWIS is so important and meaningful, and I feel very lucky to be connected with you all, even in a small way. I've had the opportunity to support the Children's Bureau by reviewing CWIS state procurement documents for about nine months. And today I'm going to share with you what I've seen in the state procurement documents for CWIS. Based on issues that commonly occur across the documents, I'm going to provide suggestions for 12 strategies to help overcome procurement challenges and attain best value. If you decide to use these strategies as I'm suggesting, I think they'll make the procurement process easier and faster, less burdensome and less complicated. You are all the experts in your functional areas and you understand the needs and parameters of your organization. So I trust that you'll choose the right takeaways from today's webinar that will help with your specific circumstances and objectives. So while I hope and think there'll be takeaways for you that are useful and help you make a difference with an easier workload to get there, there isn't any direction. It's for you to decide how you will use the suggestions and guidance. 
I'm looking forward to hearing any experiences you've had with CEDAS procurements that might help others. And I hope you will share any experiences or lessons learned relative to the 12 strategies when we pause. And I think uh, Phil will let us know when it's time to pause. So we're gonna start out by talking about a contractual foundation for best outcomes before we go into talking about the 12 strategies um, that basically I'm gonna present based on what I've seen in the procurement documents. The vast majority of the state procurements that I've seen have been well-planned, some with really amazing attention to detail. Still, they might be missing even just one critical piece that creates a weak spot in the contractual foundation that will support project operations. So what does it mean to have a contractual foundation for best outcomes? In CWIS procurement, it means an agreement with a contractor that will lead to the end result desired with cost-effective, efficient, dispute-free operations and few, if any, unanticipated requests for change orders. A solid contractual foundation is an agreement that leads to solid ability of the program manager and the IT manager to manage risk and change. Common understanding and development of the foundation is what leads to smooth operations and anticipated outcomes. For a full contractual foundation, all of the people and functional areas in the chart that you're looking at in the slide need to have the same understanding. So that would be the program manager, the IT manager, the contract manager slash procurement manager and the stakeholders. And throughout this webinar, I'm gonna to refer to contract manager and procurement manager somewhat interchangeably. Um, if I say contract manager, I also mean procurement manager. Um, and I hope that works for you. I think of myself as both. Um, and I know that sometimes those functions are separated, but sometimes they're also done together. Anyway, it takes all of these working together to create the common understanding that grounds operations in positive outcomes for all stakeholders. And of course, stakeholders include all of the beneficiaries and everybody involved or impacted by the CWIS project. The implementation contractors, the IBNV vendors, software vendors, other vendors, the state agency, the state, ACF, everybody impacted. IT managers are the subject matter experts for using technology to accomplish continuously improving outcomes for CWIS stakeholders and for keeping development user-centric and on track to achieve the project objectives. IT and program managers are the experts in understanding what is needed and in making what is contractually agreed happen with input and guidance from the contract procurement manager as needed. Child welfare program managers put it all to work, helping outcomes to be the most they can be. And contract and procurement managers are the subject matter experts with respect to the documents and contract processes, especially the specific processes of the state or the state agency. In this webinar, um, as I said, I'm gonna to refer to them interchangeably and I hope that that works for everybody. In thinking about roles and interactions in contracting in general, and in particular, some of the CWIS solicitations that have struggled to finalize CWIS agreements, when groups come together with di differing objectives and perspectives, beginning with common understanding creates trust. That trust fuels more common understanding and it fosters smooth and productive contract discussions, negotiation, and then operations. While the technicalities of establishing a contractual foundation are important, it's important too to keep in mind that trust is a very real foundation strength in all of the interactions in CWIS procurement. And that includes both internal and external interactions and working together, the interactions of functional groups within the agency, the IT manager, program manager, contract manager, procurement manager, systems engineers, and as well as when the state is interacting with CWIS contractors. Trust that the other is fair, reasonable, trustworthy, and committed to mutual well being and mutually satisfactory outcomes is important. It's like glue. The CWIS contractual foundation needs both strong technical supports and relationships grounded in trust. One of the things that seasoned contracts managers know is that if it starts out badly with a contractor, it usually ends that way. So if any of you have experience with building contractor trust and lessons learned along those lines that might help others, I hope you will share them. Next slide, please.
So based on what I've seen in the state procurement documents, I think that IT managers and program managers have significantly more ability than they think to influence both the contractual agreement and outcomes. The contract lifecycle chart here is an excerpt from the contract management standard of the National Contract Management Association. You can see the three contracting phases, pre-award, award, and post-award, and the activities that are accomplished in each phase. Uh, Pre-award, develop the solicitation, award, form the contract, post-award, perform the contract. Contract managers and procurement managers are usually viewed as knowledgeable and responsible for creating enforceable contracts and managing risk. Currently, IT managers often draft the statement of work in the pre-award phase, then hand it to the contract or procurement manager to include it in the request for proposal as the contract manager drafts and accomplishes the solicitation. The IT manager may participate in the evaluation of proposals and negotiation, but hand off for formal creation of the contract and award of the contract is to the contract or procurement manager it's handed off to close and execute the agreement with the selected vendor. The contract manager then returns the fully executed contract to the IT manager and the program management team. The IT manager and the program management team operationally then manage the contract, working with the vendor to perform the contract and hopefully accomplish the attended outcomes. The IT and the program managers are relied upon most in the, in the post-award phase. In contrast to the traditional roles focused on post-award operations for the IT and program management team, influence will make the most difference to CWIS outcomes at the front end of the process where the, develop, the solicitation is developed in the pre-award phase. Most of the difficulties I've seen in the procurement process could be mitigated or resolved before ever becoming problems through IT program manager and contract manager procurement manager collaboration at the front end of the contract life cycle in the pre-award phase. That's a shift from the traditional paradigm for procurements with the IT and program manager roles limited to drafting a scope of work, then handing it off to the contract manager for solicitation and award with return of the signed contract for uh, the program management and IT team to implement. IT managers in the program team influence and impact risk management and outcomes in pre-award, award and post-award activities. Their impact includes both contractual and operational risk with emphasis on change management. Their drive to attain best value continues throughout each phase of the life cycle, pre-award, award and post-award. But it's the front end of the contracting process that the IT and program managers have the greatest ability to influence terms manage risk, and set a foundation for best outcomes. In collaboration with the contract manager, the influence of the IT manager and program management team can shape the contract in advance of the award to ensure fewer disputes, fewer unanticipated change orders, smoother project operations, and outcomes consistent with the vision. In reviewing the state procurement documents, it's easy for me to see the disconnects um, anybody after the fact, but it's, it's easy to see the disconnects in reviewing these, the disconnects that result when development of the scope of work, solicitation and contract award are accomplished in silos. That can work for small, well-defined purchases, but CWIS is complex and the level of communication needed for all to be on the same page is greater. I've seen in some of the state procurements really outstanding attention to detail in the scope of work. Disconnects arise with the handoff for inclusion and solicitation templates. No matter how much effort is made or how exceptionally well done the scope of work is or how exceptionally well done the contract and procurement manager, uh, how exceptional they are in doing their job. Disconnects still exist. One example is when deliverables and requirements are priced in a manner that doesn't align to the type of payment that the contract calls for. Pulling forward the roles, shifting contract creation effectively into the front end of the process with greater reliance on the input of the IT manager and program managers to develop the scope of work 
in cooperation with and with the guidance of the contract manager will improve outcomes. Instead of having silos of responsibility, all will be on the same page as to how the process will move forward. In the pre-award phase, cooperative effort with all participating in determining how selection and award will occur, the basis for selection and identification of what's important as well as relative importance for selection, evaluation and selection of proposals, that will support decisions around selection and award and create the strongest foundation. If developed collaboratively with comprehensive requirements, the scope of work incorporated into the RFP effectively becomes the contractual agreement. There'll be less pressure for negotiations and less pressure on the contract manager because most of the agreement will have already been established before selection and award, again, collaboratively. So these things I'm saying are based on what I'm seeing in as commonalities across many of the state procurement documents. Next slide, please. So IT managers and program managers can significantly impact both the contractual agreement and operational outcomes through development of the scope of work that's included in the RFP. And again, the contract manager expertise and input is essential to determining acquisition strategy, the contract type, the approach to the solicitation and business requirements. The contract manager can provide valuable guidance relative to the solicitation. For example, determining presentation if selection criteria is to be weighted. The IT manager and program manager input includes acquisition approach and requirements, identifying relative value, appropriate incentives and remedies. And again, the contract manager is knowledgeable, the procurement manager and can help um, shape those. But it takes everybody together with the input to have a fully articulated, fully comprehensive scope of work that includes the technical requirements, the functional requirements and the business requirements all built into the RFP with everybody on the same page as to what's happening. That doesn't mean everybody needs to sit at the same table every time, but the parties are all on the same page as to how it's evolving and providing their input um, consistent with their areas of knowledge. So, Basically, a scenario of silos can easily accomplish chunks of work all done well that do not marry up. It's the proverbial bridge that does not meet in the middle. And that's what I'm seeing sometimes when I see state procurement documents. Pulling collaboration forward to emphasis on the pre-award activities, taking full advantage of the influence of the IT manager and program management team to impact the scope of work and requirements with guidance from the contract and procurement manager will cause final outcomes to match what was intended. Next slide, please. So the graphic in the slide shows a triangle and it represents the contractual agreement. And within that triangle, you can see the request for proposal, the proposal and the contract. And these are three documents. The request for proposal obviously is what the state is issuing the agency. The proposal is the contractor's proposal. And here, when we refer to contract, we're talking about the document that is signed that says this is when uh, this, this agreement becomes effective. The request for proposal is the foundation of the contractual agreement, having created that comprehensive scope of work at the beginning, um, even including the business requirements and building that into the RFP. The RFP is the foundation of the contractual agreement. Next slide, please. First subpoint reads, the CWIS vision. So the contractual agreement is the contract documents in order of precedence. So again, we can see the triangle, the contractual agreement, but this time you notice that there's a different order the contract is in the first order of precedence, the document that's signed. The request for proposal is in the second order of precedence and the contractor's proposal is in the third order of precedence. So the RFP is still the foundation of the contractual agreement conceptually. But what happens is 
typically in an agreement, um, and I've seen this across many of the state documents, I, I can't, can't overemphasize, this, this is a very common occurrence across the state documents. This would go very far to um, overcome and, and stop some of the challenges that make everybody pause mid process. Um, when there's a discrepancy in the terms of the contract documents that comprise the contractual agreement, interpretation is based on the order of precedence. So in the contract, the section titled order of precedence is going to state something like this. The contract documents include the following documents in the order of precedence listed. In the event of any conflict, the document in higher order of precedence shall supersede and replace the conflicting provision from the document in the lower order of precedence. So you can see in the graphic that we have in the first order of precedence, the, the, contract, you know, the contract document. Now that could look different depending upon the type of procurement, but the, the agreement that's actually signed that says, this is our agreement. Sometimes that's a cover page, sometimes it's a separate document that then incorporates the RFP and the proposal. But basically for your contract documents, and, and most of the state agreements have more than just these three as documents, contract documents that are within the order of precedence. There could, could be attachments called out that are referenced. There could be ancillary documents, standard terms and conditions of the state. Um, every agreement's different, but for conceptual purposes, the signed contract document, the RFP and the proposal, and you can see that within that RFP that it's in the state or the state agency's interest to have in the second order of precedence within that RFP is included everything that the IT manager uh, program management input and with guidance of the contract manager, everything is in that RFP, the scope of work, the requirements, deliverables, the process, the objectives, the schedule, performance, milestones, payment terms, terms and conditions, business terms and conditions, the contract type, rights and remedies, those are usually part of the terms and conditions, and then um, language and terms that go to risk management. And even, that could even include things uh, that also go to payment, things like incentives or penalties. Section 1.4, Contractual Foundation. So basically, of course, the contractor is gonna want their proposal in the second order of precedence. And basically you just need to stand your ground on this. I've seen in the state procurement documents repeatedly at the last minute contractors changing that order of precedence. And in the end, the order of precedence goes back to what is in the state's interest. But there are other ways to make this sure that that doesn't happen and that that does not present an obstacle to you. So we'll look at that as this webinar progresses and you can see how easily it can be accomplished. The lack of definition around what it is that the state will buy is one of the biggest challenges I've seen in the contract documents. I haven't seen site operations, but based on the procurements, I have no doubt that agencies are seeing many change orders that they did not expect. I've heard that states are frustrated with the results they're getting. A well-developed scope of work contained in the RFP can minimize the need for negotiations, speed to contract closure and eliminate misunderstandings that commonly arise after project operations have begun. A well-developed comprehensive and clear scope of work with measurable performance requirements is key to attaining best value and the intended project results. What is it that you wanna buy? The guidance here is this, underscore measurable performance requirements. You will receive what you ask for. The more clear your vision is for what you want, the more likely you're, you are to get it, assuming it's articulated. If you're using agile methodology and your scope of work specifies that you will buy the process, that's what you're going to get, a process. So whether traditional or agile contracting and development are used, specify the work to be done and the outcome required in measurable terms as part of the scope of work. 
If clear and comprehensive requirements are established at the pre-award phase of the contract life cycle and included in the scope of work, it will be an easy award phase. Incorporation of the RFP and proposal into the contract, along with the specified order of precedence. The only negotiation needed will be around price and potentially innovations or alternatives suggested by the contractor that are effectively, in many cases, trade-offs. The post-award phase of the contract operations will see smooth, efficient, and economical progress as a result of the common understanding developed in the pre-award phase. Again, it goes to what is it that you wanna buy? And I'm, and I'm saying this because this again is what I'm seeing as common theme across state procurement documents when challenges arise or things make the process pause. So I do wanna add that what I'm seeing in the procurement documents is sometimes one weakness and sometimes another in the midst of generally exceptionally well-prepared documents, really, really exceptionally well-prepared documents. It's clear that an enormous amount of thought, knowledge and skill is going into these documents. Some documents are unclear with respect to exactly what the requirements are for what is ultimately being purchased. In other documents, the requirements and the desired outcomes are very clear and thorough, but there's a disconnect to the payment terms. So sometimes disconnects can be figured out with effort, but interpretation is confounded due to differences in the language that's used by multiple parties contributing pieces all at separate times. The solution to many different problems is the same. Collaborate to identify what you wanna buy, how it will be bought, and that's the strategic approach, and to define the performance requirements and the standards that will be measured and aligned to payment. Everybody on the same page. Next slide, please. CWIS success directly corresponds to the extent and quality of the planning and pre-work. The importance of planning and pre-work can't be understated. States can position to manage change by planning well. Planning and pre-work are the key to creating common understanding, and it's the structuring of the procurement, the contractual agreement, to incorporate the outputs of the critical planning stage that will determine how successful the final outcomes can be. Success means, did the state get what it intended to procure? The bottom line, did the state do a good job defining the deliverables and the requirements? Essential planning and pre-work defines the objectives and the scope of work, requirements, the deliverables, and the performance standards in ways that are measurable. It develops a strategic approach to the procurement, establishing parameters for risk and change management. It creates a structure for accountability. It connects and communicates all of these in plain language, ideally using the same types of words. Again, collaboration at the beginning. Pre-work considers development of the CWIS vision, the stakeholder input, and also what is, it, what is it important for the contractor to articulate? What does the vendor need to know? Um, in, the, in the RFP. Pre-work considers the type and the method of contracting, the basis for payment and change, the tasks and the deliverables that support the objectives that in turn support the vision, technical, functional and business requirements and the applicable standards for performance. It includes performance metrics and progress milestones. And most importantly, it includes a measurable definition of done. So, so that's, that's the end of the first piece of this webinar, which is really about the contractual foundation. Um, and we're gonna go into this 12 strategies now. And I hope that contractual foundation doesn't sound like it's overstated or too simplistic. Likewise, the strategies. Again, the preparation that's going into these state documents and the state requests for proposals and the procurement documents is, is really incredible, really, really well done. It's these tiny little weak things that make the whole foundation a little bit weak. So I'm hoping that uh, you'll pull from this webinar some things that make your process smoother. So thank Phil, you. did you wanna open the forum at this point? Yeah, thank you, Kim, for um, laying that you know, really important foundation as we move into section two. 
Um, again, I'm, I'm reminded of, you know, anytime we're leading major change, it's all about what? Relationships, relationships, relationships. So um, I also wanted to, uh, before I get into questions, just first uh, remind folks, you can submit your questions using the Q&A function, which is at the top or bottom of your screen, depending. Um, and uh, just click on that button, submit your question. You can submit your question anonymously if you'd like to do that. Um, and we can either respond to those questions directly in writing, or we'll read your question aloud for the entire audience. Um, you're also able to ask questions using the raise hand feature, which again, should be at the bottom or top of your screen, sometimes uh, located in the participant um, section as well. Uh, you may raise your hand and we'll unmute your line. Um, while you're submitting those questions, um, we do have the opportunity now, I think, to um, call on uh, Nicole Harder Schaefer, who's been able to join us again. Nicole? Good afternoon. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today on our CWIS webinar. And thank you, Kim, for sharing your expertise and knowledge today with us um, as we move forward. And my apologies for not being able to be on the webinar in the very beginning. So thanks so much. Thank you, Nicole. Yep, we understand that technology sometimes is not our friend, actually. <laughs> so, uh, but we do recognize you were here not only on time and early. So uh, sorry about that technical glitch. Okay, um, I'm just kind of looking for questions we can read out loud right now, Kim, and I'm not seeing any at the moment. So we're gonna go ahead and let you continue on with part two of your discussion. Okay, thanks, Phil. Uh, we're going to go through the 12 strategies um, pretty, pretty quickly. In reviewing the procurement documents, there are 12 basic pitfalls that stand out as root causes of misunderstanding um, that are leading to faulty contracting, um, protests to award decisions, and project operations hindered by misunderstanding and unanticipated change orders. Um, the, the 12 pitfalls are relatively easy, um, and they have easy solutions. And in some cases, the solutions, the strategies to overcome the potential pitfalls are just simple best practices. In some, they involve strategic acquisition approaches and identification of requirements and standards. Most have this in common. They're simple to such a degree that you might think it's overly simple, not even worth spending time on. Think of it this way. Your parent told you to look both ways before you cross the street. It's obvious and simple, but if you do not, there will be results. There can be a world of pain. And the procurement documents that I'm seeing are put together incredibly well for the most part. And then these very little things are missed, um, which have big consequences um, in terms of you know, causing angst and pauses in the process that you don't need to experience, um, misunderstandings that you don't need to experience. So based on the procurement documents I've seen where the best laid plans have gone off course, that could have been avoided with attention to one or more of the 12 strategies. Section 2.0, 12 strategies to manage risk and change and attain best value. Um, we have about two minutes to a strategy, so I'm gonna go quickly. Um, and Phil, if you could let us know when to pause, maybe after strategy six or so, halfway through for comments or questions, if anybody wants to share anything, that would be terrific. Um, yep, or Phil, whenever you think, Phil, um, based on what you're seeing. Okay. Yep. We'll do it. Thanks, Kim. Okay. Okay. So here's, here's the first strategy. Incorporate the RFP by reference into the contract documents. Ensure the RFP is the basis for all requirements and require variances in writing. Limit the exceptions allowed. When clear and comprehensive requirements are included as part of the scope of work and contained in the RFP, when the RFP is incorporated into the contract documents by reference, and effectively, the contract has already been created, including terms and conditions to manage risk. As I mentioned previously, negotiation will be minimal. Negotiations will relate primarily to price with trade-offs of like value if bidders offer alternatives. Limiting the extent of negotiation allowed also keeps the bidders on the same playing field of risk. I want to read one paragraph, and I'm not going to do a lot of reading here, so don't worry, but I want to read one paragraph from a state RFP that is a really good example of limiting bidders' ability to negotiate. It's a paragraph, 
but I think it's worth it for you to hear and realize that you can do this. Okay, so here's, here's the paragraph the state used. Each proposed extraneous term must be specifically enumerated in writing and specify the particular RFP section, including its appendices and attachments that the proposer proposes to modify and the reasons why the change would be in the best interest of the state. Any extraneous terms must be submitted during the question and answer time period identified in the RFP calendar of events using attachment four. Extraneous terms submitted after the question and answer time, including any submitted as part of the proposer's proposal will not be considered. No extraneous terms shall be incorporated into the contract unless expressly accepted by the state in writing. Acceptance and or processing of a proposal shall not constitute acceptance of extraneous terms. Further, extraneous terms must meet all of the following requirements to be considered. A, the extraneous terms must have been submitted during the Q&A time period identified in the RFP calendar of events, questions and answer period. B, the extraneous term must be accepted by ITS, excuse me, by the state in writing. <laughs> and C, the state will not entertain any exceptions to Appendix A, the standard clauses of the state. So basically we have here a state that has done a very effective job of saying no exceptions unless they're in the state's interest. And that state has a much easier negotiation process ahead of it. Okay, next slide, please. Clarity, if I could pick only one of the 12 strategies, it would be this. This is the most pervasive across the procurement documents in terms of presenting an issue. Strategy two is to maintain clarity to the standard of the third party walking by. Not just any clarity, but clarity to the standard of the third party walking by. Could somebody walking by understand every aspect of that agreement, even if they had no background in it? Could they understand the things that might arise, the question marks around what was being bought and paid for? if there were changes, where the responsibilities would be, could they understand every aspect of that agreement? That's clarity. If any pre-knowledge of the agreement is necessary to understand, it's not as clear as it could and should be. Ambiguity is the root of most misunderstanding. It leads to disputes, delays, unanticipated change orders, and disappointing project results. So plain language, clear and no question marks. That, that would be the number one across the board. Um, when, when you've prepared your procurement documents, your RFPs, your scopes of work, read it again with the eyes of the third party walking by. So contractual and operational risk management are interdependent. Recently, there was a CWIS procurement that looked to operational risk management to protect where contractual risk management was actually inadequate due to imprecise definitions. This particular procurement involved documents created many years ago, and for a number of reasons, it was too late to correct all the definitions, but there were definitions amongst numerous documents that were all different. And so, a, a very large number of documents formed the contractual agreement, and within those documents, differing definitions occurred. Uh, the lack of clarity and the sheer volume of referenced and incorporated documents made it very difficult to interpret the contract. The state rightly decided to mitigate the, the risk with more attention to managing the risk operationally. So contractual and operational risk management, um, they're interdependent and they can balance each other out and they can both be used. Um, certainly the goal is to have a contractual agreement that is completely clear without any ambiguity. Um, in some cases, if there's a lot of history that goes back many, many, many years, um, old master services agreements, old blanket order type agreements um, where there wasn't clarity and it's too late 
to remedy it. Sometimes you can get your clarity through operational risk management and document your procedures and your agreements on site. If the contract isn't entirely clear, but it's too late to do something about that, you can build in clarity of understanding among the parties as operations unfold at each step of the process. So you're managing the risk operationally. Strategy three, ensure that definitions are consistent across all documents. These include customization, SOW, work order, statement of work, and agile. Okay, so definitions can help or hurt clarity, especially when there are many documents involved using the same word differently. Um, SOW, there's a good acronym, statement of work or scope of work. So the statement of work is typically the, the vision, the larger picture of what's going to be accomplished. And then the scope of work is the, the fully detailed requirements within the statement of work. That's typically how that's structured. It's something to watch out for when you have many, many contract documents some of which use statement of work and some of which use scope of work, all of which use SOW, um, just to make sure that you don't have any conflicts or any gaps in clarity with respect to who is responsible for what. Ideally, you wanna build all requirements into the scope of work. And we'll talk about that a little bit more so that there is no ambiguity, so that everything that's, everything that's presented as a requirement um, is ultimately required of the contractor. So definitions like contract, purchase order, master services agreement, that's the MSA there. Um, is a contract a purchase order? Is a purchase order a contract? Um, customization, configuration, work orders, um, intellectual property terms, there are so many definitions that come up, even the word contract itself, that if you see a lack of clarity, it needs definition. And one of the best things you can do is to include your own definitions and stipulate up front um, that those are the definitions that will support interpretation. You need to do the best you can to have consistent definitions across all the documents. Um, and again, watch out for capitalization. Recently, in a couple of the procurements, I saw that older documents did not use capitalization. And typically in a contract, when a term is capitalized, it's a defined term that has a meaning that you can go reference and understand exactly what that meaning is. Um, and sometimes documents, at least I've seen a few um, within the CWIS procurements that have a mix and match of whether things are capitalized or not. So you need to be cautious, try and look at everything with the eyes, again, of a third party walking by. If there's ambiguity, look to resolve that up front. If you resolve it all up front, then you're going to have a very, very smooth process. And you're much more likely to get in the end what you thought you were buying because everybody's on the same page and the interpretation is all the same. So next slide, please. So this is an example of really great use of definitions by a state. And I wanted to pull this up so that you could see specifically a couple of important definitions. You can see what actually seems so simple as down toward the bottom, they've defined contract. The contract is this RFP, any addendum to this RFP and the bidder's proposal response to this RFP is accepted by the state. They've defined what they mean when they use the word contract. Um, there have been more than a few CWIS procurements where the lack of definition around the term contract and differing use of the term contract in different places within the documents has led to misunderstanding or confusion. So as simple as it seems, if you, if, as, as the state did here, if you 
make sure that you define these things up front. You've, you've got a long way toward preventing problems before they happen. The last one on this list, contra contra contractor slash implementation vendor. The bidder awarded the contract. How simple does that seem? Until you see a bunch of procurement documents or uh, procurements that involve many different documents, and it's not clear to a third party walking by, which sometimes would be me when I'm reading them, for example, um, the use of the word implementation vendor. Well, is that the same thing as the integration vendor? So it's really important to clarify these things, even when it seems simple. The term here, amendment, and the number one least defined and most needed definition um, in all of the procurement documents is around pricing. So you can see here that this state has defined all-inclusive, loaded, firm, fixed pricing. And they've mentioned that all the things that that fixed price includes, it includes overhead and fees or profit, clerical support, supervision. They've uh, time spent in traveling to and from. Most of the procurement documents that I've seen, and, and I, I do wanna say most, would have been aided with additional clarification around the pricing terminology. It's not always clear. And in particular, the use of cost and price are confused. So it's so important. When we talk generally, we could say cost and price. Well, the cost is this, the price is that. And we know exactly what we mean because we're being conversational, even if we're not precise about the difference between cost and price. Generally, the price is going to include profit when you're talking about a fixed price. But many of the procurements talk about cost and price some of them call for a fixed price proposal and then they have a cost workbook and it's not always clear in these. Again, to the standard of a third party walking by, is the bidder supposed to include their profit within that cost workbook? Sometimes it appears that they're supposed to include fixed prices within that workbook that are inclusive of their profit and sometimes not, and, and unfortunately, sometimes it's not clear. Um, so these are important, again, also the all-inclusive hourly rate. So when you, when you put together your documents, really think about all the definitions that are needed. Next slide, please. Okay, so strategy four, align objectives, tasks, requirements, deliverables, acceptance criteria, performance metrics, and payment. One of the states provided an impressive set of aligned documents, including technical, function, functional, and business requirements, all aligned to quality standards and objectives. Their alignment is a recipe for success as long as there's no ambiguity in the contract documents. And as long as when there are changes as the project progresses, all changes are agreed in writing with follow through occurring to make formal changes to all of the documents presenting requirements for continuing alignment. So alignment ensures common understanding of how all the acquisition components work together and a common understanding of the expectations. So you have your objectives, your tasks that feed into those to achieve the objectives, the requirements within each task, the deliverables, um, the, the acceptance criteria is critical, the performance metrics, and the payment terms, and all of those should align. And, and the two ways I've seen it done, um, one of them is to use Excel workbooks, and another is sort of an outline type format. And what they have in common, both that really works, is sort of a numerical system that aligns them all. So you can see what feeds into what, what's related to what, and you could actually take the objectives out to the tasks, out to the requirements, both with alignment, both to the functional requirements and business requirements, um, 
right, right to the acceptance criteria performance and payment. And you can see then how it's paid for. Okay, next slide, please. So this is just a quick example of the outline type format. Um, and you can see on the slide, it's an outline, basically, it's not necessary to see every word here, but basically they're outlining the activities that are gonna happen, the tasks, responsibilities, functional and technical requirements, um, tasks, deliverables, and, and it's all aligned and it feeds up. So there's no doubt how this, within this particular procurement, there was no doubt how it all aligned to the price in the end. The, the distinction again is the number here. Okay, next slide, please. All right, thanks, Kim. Uh, just to, um, uh, before you move forward, I just wanna again remind folks that you are able to submit questions using the Q&A function. Um, you can chat also uh, with us or you can raise your hand. Um, and um, uh, again, I want to also uh, remind folks that we are gonna have a part two of this in August and so, um, Kim, I think we're on strategy five, and we have about 15 minutes um, before we will move into our final Q&A session, along with one final polling question, and then some final comments. So again, just wanted to encourage everyone to submit those questions to us so that we can um, address those. All right, thank you. And Kim, go ahead and continue on. Okay, great. Uh, strategy five, commence with a blanket statement of compliance. It's not always clear whether the requirements included in the RFP are part of the finally agreed scope of work. And that is a big ambiguity, um, again, across many of the procurement documents. The requirements were all there, but after the negotiation, there's a proposal and now there's lack of clarity. Are those requirements all still applicable? So you can manage risk for success with a blanket statement of compliance that obligates the contractor to perform in accordance with all applicable laws, regulations, guidance, then current best industry standards and practices, everything that is a requirement for you. This language here is not um, some pat template language. You need to really think about what it is that you want them to perform in accordance with and include it all in a blanket statement of compliance, again, that is contained within that scope of work. So, and, and I'll show you how to use a caveat toward the end so that that doesn't get lost in negotiation. Um, the point really is to make sure that the contractor is bearing the risk of identifying the requirements. Um, so many of the states have used things like bidders libraries very effectively to present requirements to the bidders. And this is a terrific strategy. And again, making sure that there's a caveat that keeps responsibility to identify what is applicable in terms of applicable laws, regulations, standards, et cetera. You still want the burden of identifying those on the contractor. Um, so, Basically, here's, here's an example, uh, a one sentence example that a state used very well to create a blanket statement of compliance that uh, basically kept, they, provi they provided examples of guidance document standards, et cetera, um, that the contractor needed to comply with. But then they also said, proposed solution must comply with the most recent form of any and all regulatory standards that apply to the CWIS technologies sought by this RFP, whether or not they are identified by this RFP. So that was truly exceptional. So what happens when, when the project is in operational and, and a new standard evolves, um, there's, there's clarity as to who's responsible for being aware what the standards are that are applicable. So a little bit of help from the state to suggest, you know, look at these standards, um, doesn't basically shift that burden to the state. Okay, next slide, please. A state agency can eliminate ambiguity and manage risk by stipulating responsibility of the contractor to call ambiguities to the attention of the state in writing with or prior to the bid. Again, putting the responsibility on the contractor. So strategy six is provide for sole discretion of the state, sole discretion to determine interpretation if ambiguities are not called to the attention of the state in writing and are later, later identified. This is 
very protective and many of the states have done this and, and a few haven't. So I, I wanna raise that for that reason. So um, clear, comprehensive, without ambiguity, incorporated in the line, strategic, strategic acquisition. Um, if there are any comments, we're, we're halfway here and we have about two minutes of strategy for the next six. <laughs> so Bill, do you have any questions there? Oh, and I, sorry, I kind of cut in early. So nope, you are good to continue on, Kim. Thank you very much. And I love this acronym here. I like that you you connected it to CWIS. <laughs> <Very cute. laughs> okay. Great. Okay, uh, let's see. So the competitive solicitation, uh, you notice there's not a strategy number on this particular slide. This is just best practice. Um, and basically collaborate and plan to extend opportunity and encourage innovation. Focus on small and disadvantaged business utilization, set offs. And, and I've got this in the slide because I wanted to call to your attention that one of the really um, impressive things that states have done is to create opportunity through sub-tiered set offs. Even when it appears that uh, there isn't opportunity, they are in fact asking the primary contractor they award to, to uh, also use lower tiered subcontractors who are small and disadvantaged. Other things that can be done to extend opportunity and encourage innovation are to put out requests for information and advance notice to bidders looking for suggestions. Um, so it's in advance of solicitation. And then alternate bids or multiple bids you can have additive or trade-off bids. Basically in CWIS, we are usually for, for a larger solution, we are looking for best value type solutions. Um, and we're, we're, we're gonna talk in the next slide uh, about how to manage risk and uh, reduce award protests in the context of best value. Um, but considering you do want innovation for CWIS and yet at the same time, you still want a competitive solicitation that feels fair. The best thing you can do in terms of keeping your solicitation fair is to just put yourself in the shoes of the bidders and think, does it, does it seem fair? Um, if you give an opportunity to one bidder, give it to all. If you are going to allow alternate bids if, if you choose to say, these are the requirements that we want. So we want you to provide a proposal in response to these specific requirements, but you may also propose alternatives or innovative alternate approaches, then give that same opportunity to everybody. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, strategy seven, again, with the competitive solicitation, keep it fair. Define responsive and responsible. Align selection criteria to the requirements. Ensure no unfair advantage. And consider the impact of negotiated scope of work and risk to fair competition. So when you have bidders and you find your competitive range, and you commence negotiations. If you are modifying the scope of work that you requested in your RFP as requirements, then there's a different amount of risk involved. Or if you're modifying the terms and conditions for indemnity or the limit of liability, there's a different amount of risk involved and risk correlates to pricing. So you could see that bidders would feel that that was unfair. If you provide bidders with the opportunity to revise their proposals, then provide that opportunity to all of your bidders in the competitive range until you make your final best value decision. Everybody should have that same opportunity. So during discussions, all of the opportunities should be equal. Maintain fair and disseminated Q&A. So respond fully to what's asked, but make sure everybody gets those Q&A. And I think, I think the states have done a good job with this from what I've seen. Um, and some have posted them online and, and that's been useful too. 
Make sure that you request best and final offers, again, from those bidders in your competitive range. It would be viewed as unfair to request a best and final only from one proposer. So quantitative, and, and that said, I wanna say that I did see a procurement where bidders were notified that best and final may only be requested from one proposer. I wouldn't encourage that because there's a sense of perception of unfairness around that. Um, but in best value, you're gonna have quantitative and qualitative evaluation. And at the end of the day, what's gonna matter is what's on the next slide. Um, so next slide, please. Do what you say you're gonna do. What really matters is that you tell the bidders what you're going to do, how you're going to evaluate them, what the weights are that you're going to be looking at. But again, by the nature of best value awards, you're looking at both quantitative and qualitative subjective evaluation. You wanna be fair and, and really truly fair, but there is an aspect that's qualitative and subjective. And I have seen a few states that have really tried hard to create a fair, fair, fair competition. And by the way, I haven't seen any states that had an unfair competition. I haven't seen anybody with an unfair competition. So all of, all of this is really suggestions to make the process easier with fewer protests. Um, a state, as long as you say what you're going to do, and then you do that, and you are giving the same opportunity to everybody who's bidding, it's fair. So what you really want to be on that lookout for is don't say things that you don't follow through on. Better to not say anything than to say it and not follow through on it. And do create a fair process, fair and reasonable process, and then do document how you're assessing and evaluating. Make sure that your criteria is shared so bidders do understand what you're going to be looking at and the relative weights. But most important by far and away is do what you say you're going to do. And right along with that is you have to maintain consistency with the practices used by the state agency um, for its procurements that do not include financial uh, participation from the federal government. So, and, and I, last thing I want to say on that is that I have seen um, states that have had problems because they didn't follow their own state procurement manual, uh, their state procedures. So be on the lookout for that too. It's not just what is said in the RFP, it's also what are the published procurement practices of the state or the agency. Strategy nine, align strategic acquisition type and payment terms to the contract type. So basically there are four things that I wanna say about, about this that I think might help you. And again, they stem from what I'm seeing in the procurement documents. Strategic acquisition involves determining and articulating the contract type and the payment terms to attain best value. The four issues I'm gonna talk about, I believe will help speed procurement documents to closure and eliminate misunderstanding. I think they'll help you have fewer unanticipated change orders. First of the four is create a clear, unambiguous framework for calculation of compensation. So one of the most common weak points that occurs in the state procurement documents is lack of clarity of pricing. And that includes confusing and undefined use of terms, misalignment of the contract type to how payments are made and lack of what if clarifiers. So is it a fixed price contract, a cost reimbursable type contract, a time and materials type contract, whatever it is, it needs to align to compensation terms that make sense for that type of contract. 
And I don't have time to go through all of it here, but I can tell you that your contract and procurement manager know, understand this. And this is where their guidance is very, very important. So you want to select the type of contract based on the degree to which you know your scope of work and the degree to ris of risk that's involved. Again, your contract manager and procurement manager will understand that most often a fixed price contract is in the interest of the state because when there's a change, that places the risk around the change on the contractor, that that's the burden of the contractor. But again, your contract manager, your procurement manager can help with strategic selection of the contract type. It's again, based on scope of work, the extent to which that's known and the risk the government will assume. This is an issue that I've seen in many of the state procurements that the payment terms did not align to the contract type. And right off the bat, and, and I hope you'll remember this, when you do an RFP, in the very beginning, let the contractor know right out of the gate what type of contract the agency intends to award. Because sometimes the procurement documents 70, 80, 100 pages more. And it's not clear until the end what type of contract will, will be awarded. So first few paragraphs right up there with your calendar around um, you know, questions and answers and your schedule of events for, a, for uh, the solicitation and the award, right up there. Um, identify the type of contract and make it strategic with input from your contract manager. Common what if clarifiers that are missing um, include things like how will materials and travel be reimbursed? What happens to pricing at new contract years? Um, is there escalation to pricing? If so, what's, what's it based on? Your contract manager can help you understand ways and strategies that you can deal with annual escalation to pricing up front um, in, in a way that is going to get you best value. So this is where their guidance will come in. Um, you can consider negotiating escalation to tie it to standard indices. Um, and you can consider adding most favored customer language, the basic RFP. Basically, that says that your bidder is going to give you the best pricing they give to any of their uh, commercial clients, that your pricing will not exceed any pricing they give to anybody else. Um, and again, your contract and procurement manager can give you ideas for that, or they can help build it in. Uh, the last thing would be before issuing the RFP, prepare to assess and document price reasonableness with in-house estimates. Okay, next slide, please. Strategy 10. This is a short one. Use of affirmative language. In its RFP, a state recently asked contractors to propose CWIS solutions and asked them to suggest any additional capacities their solution might have. One contractor responded, our CWIS solution can accomplish integration of additional points of data exchange. Does that mean they're going to do it within the fixed price they proposed? Or is it available for an additional cost or price? In the RFP, use affirmative language. The contractor will do this. Be careful not to allow the contractor to reduce clarity by using conditional language in its proposal. Some states have included direction to contractors that any features they describe as features in their, that their solution is capable of will be considered to be included in the proposed fixed price unless they expressly call out that there will be additional charge for that. So that's an ambiguity we see a lot um, and you can resolve that right up front too. So only two strategies left. Um, again, this goes back to strategy 11, identify the order of precedence. Because the number one way that contractors will try and transfer risk is a last minute change to the order of precedence. Over and over, we're seeing that at the, that negotiations occur and all negotiations are happening based on what it's understood the order of precedence is in the basic contract. And then at the last minute, the contractor changes the order of precedence, entirely changing the balance of risk and what language 
applies in the event of conflict. So be really cautious of that. In some cases, I think uh, vendors are more experienced in their negotiating for their particular product line. And it seems to me that it's possible that on the other side of the coin, um, the state agency is, is not always seeing that that occurred. Also look out for transfer of risk by the contractors, anything that's a change order opening. If you read the, the proposals and the contracts and you keep an eye open, not only for that clarity, standard of the third party walking by, but also scan it. Where could there be a change order request happening in this? Where is their obfuscation of the affirmative language that it should? And where is there the battle of the forms potentially happening? because they've embedded hyperlinks to standard terms and conditions. Watch out for responsibility shifts and also even language around approvals. So for example, one contractor uh, buried within its proposal that the state needed to respond within three days or, it was, or, or their documents were considered approved. That, that's not, not reasonable. And again, there's two ways to handle that put the requirements up front so it's it's non-negotiable and unless and they meet, need to call it out consider that there's value to changes in risk levels that are called out in the proposals um, and then i guess watch out for also in transfer of risk for warranty changes and in particular the the contractor approach to negotiating warranties that involves changing when that warranty period starts so does the warranty start when the product is manufactured, when it's delivered, when it's finally approved, when it's accepted, when it's put into operation? If you present the terms you want up front and then don't allow changes, you are going to get what you want. And that's the easiest way to negotiate without negotiating. Next strategy, please. Last strategy, 12. Remember, the easiest way to negotiate the terms you're seeking, include them as requirements within the scope of work in the RFP, provide for limited exceptions to the RFP, and fully articulate each requirement so no further discussion is needed. In this way, the IT manager can achieve negotiation without negotiating to ensure that what's needed becomes part of the contract. Last slide. So this is a final tip. This is a useful caveat that will work not only in contracts, sounds a little legalese, but not only in the contracts, but also in the scopes of work, notwithstanding anything to the contrary in the doc contract documents. If there's something you want to be very clear on that you think there could be ambiguity upon, um, preface it with this statement and then make sure that what you've put here is in the first order or the second order of precedence um, if the first is the contract. So for example, high risk points um, within a project are points of transition, when there's change, when there's termination of the project. Those are the places where there's a lot of risk, uh, changes to work scope, contractors, force majeure events, things like hurricanes, floods that can delay or stop projects, termination for any reason with or without cause. Um, so if you start, for example, notwithstanding anything to the contrary in the contract documents, and then give a bullet list of the things that you must have at those points of transition, it could be helpful. So just uh, two, two bullets, uh, just as an example, contractor will maintain all source code in escrow, which shall be released to the state upon completion of, con of the contract acceptable to the state and state's final payment. Um, or in the event of notwithstanding anything to the contrary in the contract documents, in the event of termination for convenience or default for any reason whatsoever, contractor will provide a certificate of destruction evidencing the destruction of all confidential information and data. Uh, you, can, you can just come up with the bullets as you need them. Think about what can go wrong, where are the high risk points, and use that wherever you need it within your documents to make sure that you're going to get what you need. In summary, the IT manager has significant influence to impact what's included in the contract. A clear scope of work, clear pricing, and a clear order of precedence work together to support 
mutual understanding and dispute-free operations. And ensuring this clarity is the most important thing you can do to manage risk and to support efficient and economical project outcomes. This clarity with measurable performance criteria and a definition of done is the key to ensuring that the state agency will get the result that it's looking for and have um, avoid the kinds of delays and hindrances that are sometimes seen because of misunderstanding. So that completes the 12 strategies. All Again. right, Kim. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for running through that. We appreciate it. Um, and we're so thankful for you to give us those uh, strategies and, and uh, some are reminders, some are, are new to us. We've been watching the chat as uh, comments have been coming in and uh, we recognize we're just about out of time for questions today. However, we'd like to encourage you if you um, like or uh, you had a question that you didn't have a chance to submit, please submit those to CWIS at uh, CWIS.questions at ACF.hhs.gov. Now, those of you that are with us, we'd still like to engage you one last time before we move ahead um, because we'd like your input for next month. Could you please, um, not next month and just uh, next month and going forward, but um, uh, we're going to launch a polling question here before you uh, before we wrap up. Um, and we'd like for you to select the topics that interest you for the CWIS Contracts Part 2 webinar in August and just ask you to select all of these that apply. Um, so we're going to give you just about 30 seconds to uh, respond to these uh, topics. Just pick all that apply that you would like us to focus on uh, during Part 2 of this webinar. Um, if there is other comments you'd like to, you may submit those uh, using the Q&A function or the chat, either one. All right, we're going to give you about uh, 10 more seconds to select all that apply. Okay, we'll go ahead and close the poll. And wonderful. So, um, Okay, there's lots here, um, areas of interest, and um, some with, you know, nearly 70% of you have interest in uh, understanding contract for a as a service. So that's wonderful. Thank you for that feedback. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and wrap us up. First of all, I just want to say thank you to our participants for attending today. We appreciate your active participation in those four polling questions, as well as the chat and questions that you've submitted along the way. We continue to ask for you to submit continued questions to your federal analyst, analyst or to our CWIS uh, email address. Um, again, mark your calendars. You should see a save the date and a registration coming out next week for our upcoming webinar. Uh, CWIS Contracts and Procurement Part 2 on August 25th. Um, and uh, again, please contact your assigned analyst if you have any suggestions, feedback, or questions or issues. Um, last thing I'll say is that many of you uh, asked this question um, about whether or not this is going to be available to you after today. So we will post the recording of today's webinar along with the handouts to our DSS website. Um, Again, uh, we've heard some comments around asking for more examples of good language and how to best uh, use CSWAP uh, in this process. So we appreciate all that feedback and we will take that into account for next month. Um, there are some references that are also included in your handouts. We, ask, or we look forward to providing these handouts to you um, so that you can take a closer look. And with that, I wanna thank again our presenters. Um, Kim Bennett, thank you so much for your expertise today. And thank you, Nicole Harder Schaefer, um, and uh, all the federal staff that are on the call today. And with that, that will conclude today's webinar. Thank you all for being here. Thank you.